everybody. Welcome to Therapy Dog Talk. My name is Sherry. My dog's name is Sunny and we are training to be an animal assisted counseling team. If you are just getting started and not really sure where to get started, we have a free guide for you that you can find at freeguide.therapydogtalk.com. Today we're going to be talking with a therapy dog researcher named Dr. Colleen Dell, and she also has experience as a therapy dog team with her dogs. So I'm really excited for her to join in so that you can get to know her. Oh my Hi. goodness, I did it! <laughs> we found you! <laughs> wow, I was lost there for a while. That's okay. <laughs> I need my dog. Where's my dog? Who do you have there with you, EJ? We have a new pup in the house as of Thursday. Her name is Molly. Yeah. How old is Molly? Molly is going to turn four, same as EJ. They're just slowly integrating together, and it's been fun. They're going to be good friends. That's awesome. I love yeah. that. Well, Colleen, for those who don't know you, can you introduce yourself and your animal partners to us? Yes. I am Colleen Dell. I am at the University of Saskatchewan. And I have a research chair in One Health and Wellness, and I'm a professor there. And I have worked with a number of therapy dogs who also worked in other areas. We've done projects on service dogs, companion animals. So the three who have passed are Kisby, Annabelle, and Subi. And two passed last year in Subi in 2019. And then I have EJ here who just turned four and he just passed his therapy dog test <laughs> uh, about a month ago. Yeah, yeah. And now we have Molly and Molly is just a natural. She's, uh, as I said, almost a four year old bulldog. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I'm looking forward to working with her too. That's really great. And you've yeah. participated in several different therapy dog programs with them, haven't you? Yeah, so we have St. John's Ambulance here in Saskatchewan, and, and they're all over Canada, and that's a regular therapy dog program. And then we also, I started with Darlene Chalmers, Dr. Darlene Chalmers at University of Regina, um, something called um, Positive Support, and that's within our prisons and our jails here. So that's more of a wellness program. We work with sometimes with a counselor, sometimes without working with the dogs. We also have Pause Your Stress, which is on, which is on campus at the University of Saskatchewan. And we work in partnership with St. John's Ambulance with that. So lots of, lots of words, lots of acronyms, but underlying all that is attention to research and, and really developing that evidence base for this field, which has really grown recently, but typically has not had a lot of evidence behind it at least not typical Western evidence, right? Yeah, definitely. And I definitely do want to get into that. I graduated with an MFT in marriage and family therapy just in May, and I was doing a lot of right. research around animal assisted therapy. And I noticed how much that research increased just within like the last seven years, like just yeah. 15. So that's yeah. really great. Yeah. How did you initially begin researching the human animal bond and why is it so important to you? Right. I've always studied addictions. That's my field is addictions and mental health. And prior to that was criminalization and working in the prison system. And I'd been in the addictions field for, I don't know, almost 20 years, if not a little bit longer. And then I was just getting kind of tired of it. Just tired of it in the sense that it's not a very positive field to, <laughs> to be within, right? And it's not one where you see a lot of change happening very quickly, especially at the policy level or what's offered at the provincial level, anything like that, right? It's really hard and you see progress and then you see back and you see progress. So I was thinking of leaving academia and just, I'm not sure what I was going to do, but something, <laughs> maybe work for an NGO or something. And then someone said, well, before you do that, you should just see if there's another area you want to research. Something that you love because I had a sabbatical coming up. And so I was kind of blurted out and I said, I love my dogs. And then I honestly, I went home and I Googled dog and therapy dog. No, I put, I think I put dog in addiction. And then a therapy dog came up or the word therapy dog. And I was like, what's this? <laughs> and then I was like, oh, and at that time there was only one study and I can't remember the author right now, but he was doing, he brought uh, therapy dogs into an addiction treatment center. I think he had a controlled trial. I can't, honestly, I can't remember. That was the only thing that existed. So I was like, aha. <laughs> so yeah, so that's how that started. That's awesome. So you're like, I like dogs and there's a research team here. <laughs> yeah. So why not? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's really great. Yeah. 
I know that you consider your animals to be a part of your team and that you have a strong commitment to animal welfare. Yeah. How does that impact your work and your research? Well, my whole background has been in community-based research. And when I was doing my undergrad, the only methods I knew were feminist methods. That's, I, and everything is community-based and it's about voice, right? So that's how I kind of grew up in academia. I, I didn't know there was anything else. And I, I learned quickly that there are other ways, right? But yeah, so that attention to community-based research is in everything that I've ever done. And I've done a lot of work on Indigenous health as well. And again, incredibly important to have everyone's lived experiences and voices and other world views at the table as well. So when I started, when I was like, oh, this is kind of neat. And I got my sabbatical to work around animals and addictions and mental health. I thought, well, pff, I have a dog and I've had dogs, but I, I'm not sure how to incorporate their voice. And so I thought the first thing I needed to do was to go to a dog training school. And I've been to like classes before with my family members of the canine ones. So I went to Extreme Canine in the States. I think it was for three weeks. Me and Annabelle at the time went, the bulldog. She was great. And, you know, I really learned there of who I was working with. And I remember Behesha Doan, she was the trainer there. She had said in the very first class, will you still love me when you understand who I really am from the dog's perspective? And I remember thinking, what is she talking about? It's that dog. Oh, I, how wrong I was. <laughs> oh, how wrong I was. And I think you can see that in the research coming out now how much more we know about dogs, right? Yeah. So that was so important to me. And then I came back home and I published an article in Substance Use and Misuse with Annabelle as the first author because I thought her voice needed to be heard at the very beginning of doing this work. And I also thought I might get let go because who does that? <laughs> but I kept my job and it was actually really accepted very well. In fact, I wrote a second article with her in my best interpretation of her experiences and what her voice would be. Again, it's limited because it's me. But yeah, so we did that. And I just think it's so important. It's this reciprocal relationship. And that's what One Health is all about, what my chair is in. So it's that relationship between humans, animals, and the environment. And without one being healthy, they all can't be healthy. So mm -hmm. that's where we focus. I love that. Can you tell us a bit more about the therapy dog programs that you and your team are involved in and kind of what they mean to you? Yeah, so I think just to make it simple, we have we work with St. John's Ambulance, which is our national therapy dog program and the one we have in our province here of Saskatchewan. And we work with them in all types of settings in doing the research. So maybe just as an example, our most recent study by our team was with hospital emergency patients, and we did a controlled trial. And that worked out really, really well, because I think a controlled trial is really important you know, to contribute to literature. And we took a patient-oriented perspective. So again, accounting for people's lived experiences and so forth. And we found that the therapy dogs reduced pain for the patients in the emergency department. So we were the first emergency department in Canada to have a therapy dog visit, which was quite a job to get that to happen. But it did happen, which is really, really good. So there's that, a regular therapy dog visiting type program. We also have those dogs, myself and Darlene Chalmers, in our regional psychiatric center, where we do more working with a therapist mm -hmm. along with the dogs. And then Darlene and I also have the positive support program at Drumheller Prison in Alberta. And that's a canine assisted wellness program, more of an experiential learning for the individuals who are in prison. And it's really about reconnecting for them because we say the opposite of addiction is connection. And I mean, animals in particular, dogs and the connection that we can have with them, right? Yeah. Which is just amazing. So yeah. yeah. Very mm -hmm. cool. What do you really hope people are able to take away from your research in this space? Probably that health, a Western definition of health is that health is the absence of disease. When we introduce the dog and the relationships we have and the bond and so forth that you see with therapy dogs and other dogs, it's so much more. It's about that connection, right? Yeah. So I really think that's hopefully what people could take away. Yeah, and that these are sentient beings and we have a relationship with them. And it really is that that I think is the largest challenge ahead and that yeah. I'm hoping that people can start to recognize. And I think through COVID, 
if people have been reflecting about their pets in their own homes, I think we have moved quite fast in that two year period, much quicker than we would have without that. Cause I know before people would be like, what are you doing? And what is a service dog? And why does someone with PTSD need service dog? I don't really get it. I'm a human and, and we know how to fix humans. Whereas you saw as the pandemic went on, and people were isolated at home and so many people did get dogs or had pets already. And they're mm. like, I get it. I know. Yeah. I don't know how to explain it, but boy, right. Yeah. Was that animal important to my family's health and wellness? So that was, yeah, I think that that helped a lot. Yeah. I definitely saw so many people turn to animals. I know some of my neighbors even fostered during that time because they knew that once their job resumed they wouldn't be able to dedicate enough time to the dog but yes, while they were home they wanted to provide that home to someone who needed it yeah and then and that's such a good point too because you saw all the animals that were sent to rescues right when they did go back to work and I think that just yeah. still speaks to how disposable animals are there is not this equality between animals humans and environment we're far 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 away from that but I think yeah. the more attention we can give, especially with therapy dogs and the amazing work that they do, like we had here in our vaccination clinics, bringing the dogs into the vaccination clinics. It was just amazing, right? That distraction and the support that they provided. And so, I mean, thousands upon thousands of people saw the dogs there and I'm sure they're like, a dog? Yeah. Hmm, what is about this? There, <laughs> there's something there. They wouldn't be here if there wasn't a reason, right? So yeah. I think that has as again, pushed our thinking forward. Yeah. Well, and I feel like dogs just went so many more places with us during the pandemic because anywhere that was really like pandemic friendly was dog friendly. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, 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 very much so. Yeah. So that relationship, that connection, how have you seen that manifest with your own dogs, especially as you did therapy work with them? Yeah, that relationship, uh, you know, I just see how much I've changed and how much I've grown yeah. and how much more that I understand now and just realizing how unique each of them are and just always being in tune into their experience when no matter what setting we are in, but just being in tune with how they're feeling and like having half of my mind on the participant and the other half on the dog and always making sure that they're comfortable and I'm facilitating. I almost feel like I'm the facilitator and sometimes speaking for the dog because the clients want to know or the participants want to know so much about the dogs, right? Yeah. And yeah, I almost feel like I'm that role. And then, and, and, I mean, they're dependent on me, obviously, but I think I became highly dependent on them as well as I realized how important this bond was and that it can form. And it's very unique compared to what we have with other humans when we start to really reflect on that and understand that in a lot of loss in my own life was just like these animals are here right yeah. and and they yeah when I look back now it's like wow and then with their own passing I mean it's difficult but it's just like what a gift to have yeah. these bonds and these relationships right that are some are a little bit more complex than the other, but some I can think of like with Kisby, it was just like, the, it was just so easy. It was just so easy. Yeah. Yeah. I remember we talked about recording this episode just after Pet Remembrance Day and talking yeah. about how you manage that loss of an animal who you built such a great bond with. And I think yeah. you said that you've done quite a bit of research in this space. Yeah. Yeah, we've we've been doing some members of our team have been doing some work or they had a recent publication on service dogs because we worked a lot with service dogs and veterans who have lost the grief to their service dog. And I think, you know, just going back to the beginning there and talking about lived experience, I mean, I'm not just researching, but I'm out there thousands of hours with the dogs and and that loss part is very real as well, right? So really really experiencing it and, and just bringing that all in as we look at our research questions and what it's like to be a handler, what it's like to, to have that bond and then lose, right? Yeah. And I think, like for me, I wrote an article, I wrote two with Annabelle. I really feel like they're colleagues. They are colleagues yeah. and very much, I mean, they're at work with me and so forth. So it's, yeah, and it's and something hopefully 
we're paying more and more attention to in society. And, and you see that. You see some companies giving bereavement days, right, mm -hmm. when a, a pet is lost and so forth. So, yeah. yeah. Those are the companies who get it. <laughs> yeah, oh, they get it. They totally get it, yeah. 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 Have you learned anything in your research that's helpful for therapy dog handlers when they do lose their partner? You know, for me, I uh, wrote a memorial, like an obituary. That was really, really important. And I think every time we do something like that, so I wanted to get into the newspaper and I thought, I don't care how much this is going to cost because she's just done so much in our community. This was Annabelle. Then I found out you can't put an obituary in. It can only go under the classified sections where you would sell a pet or whatever. And I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> this isn't right. right. So, you know, going through all the channels and then finding the right person who was able to publish it just beautifully in that section, like half a page, like <laughs> there it was to make a statement, right? To make yeah. that statement and. And they were actually working on changing that behind the scenes. They're a therapy dog handler, but they're way up in the media in that division to be able to have the pets in a, more of a memorial type way and not under classifieds, right? So mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a good answer, but it was whatever makes sense to individuals. And to me, it's writing and mm -hmm. writing and having a cause <laughs> was just like, allowed me to I guess grieve and get out whatever is in me but it, it came out in that way and that just felt just even writing that obituary was just like over and over of trying to get the right words was really important because it, it's, it's just solidifying what she meant to me and the community and in our office we also do digital videos which are about four minute videos with words and and so forth and we've gone through that training so i made a digital video of her as well and that was really healing right so incredibly yeah. i could watch it now and not cry whereas yeah i just cried and cried and cried and cried and cried right which is yeah. good which is so good so good so so good yeah is that video you made of her on your youtube channel it is. Yeah, it is. It's awesome. on my website, ColleenDell.com. It's quite near the top with the obituary. Okay. And then there's a link to the video. Yeah. Very and I remember cool. one of the times we, Annabelle and I took, it was about a 24 hour train trip. It was longer than that because it was snowing and the train tops kept stopping. But anyways, we were together and she was on the train. She had full access to the train because of our therapy dog work and research. And trains are slow and people are on there. And it was really great because she visited, oh my gosh, I visited with so many people. They would come knock on my little cabin to visit with Annabelle and so forth. And I remember leaving that trip thinking about how much unresolved grief people had. Yeah. Because it just kept coming up and they would meet Annabelle and all of a sudden they were telling me and it, it just kept coming back to grief mm -hmm. and loss. And I thought, oh, it's so interesting how having the dog enabled that space, right, for people yeah. to share. And I don't know, that just reminded me of that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. We had another guest on who was part of a therapy dog team that went to Camp Widow in Southern oh, California. Okay. And they just had so many, like, powerful moments they oh. were sharing from being there with the dogs for the widows. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. I like what you mentioned, and you didn't mention this directly, but it made me think of because you were saying that the person who helped you publish Annabelle's obituary mm -hmm. was also a therapy dog handler, but worked in media. Yeah. yeah. And you're a therapy dog handler and work in research. And I just think it's really cool how we can impact the field based on like our own individual areas of expertise and interest as well, even if yeah. it's not something that's obviously therapy yeah. dog. Like, the media, for example. Yeah. Yeah. It is, I, I never really thought about that. That's such a really, I mean, that's a really, really good point, right? Because in what other field do you bring all these people together that have, could potentially have such disparate backgrounds, right? But you're here yeah. for the same kind of cause or, you know, the same goals, you know, how important this work is out into the community. So yeah, that's yeah. a really good point. Yeah. It's something that I've noticed, you know, everyone gets into therapy dog work because of some significant moment even if it's just they really notice a special bond with their dog that they wanted to share with someone else and, and I don't mm -hmm. think just to downplay yeah. that but yeah 
but for others it's been you know something personal in their lives that happened maybe even before then and so it's just interesting yeah. how dogs help us find our purpose sometimes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh yeah. and i know and i'm i'm sure every handler can say that too but even when not just purpose i totally agree with that but even when you're not having the best day and then yeah. i go out with the dogs and it's like oh Right, a visit with the dog and what they can do for others just does for me as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Earlier, you were talking a little bit about kind of the nature of your research, and I know Jared had a question around what your research looks like in terms of are you do you mainly focus on like anecdotal kind of qualitative research, or is there also quantitative research involved, and how are you able to yeah. look at that? Definitely both. We started more qualitatively because we we're trying to figure out what does this mean? And, and there wasn't really much out there, right? Yeah. So trying to, to get that understanding. Then we have, have some scales and then we had a pain scale when we were doing our controlled study, right? And I think the challenge comes sometimes with, we really want to have this in-depth understanding of what's going on. But I think at the same time, it's really hard to measure the actual interactions because they're so short. So like, yeah. you know, you're in the hospital emergency department for 10 minutes with somebody and then you're on to the next person. So realistically, how many questions can I actually ask you, right? Or sure. then going through the ethics if you want to follow up with that person when they're back home, but you know, they're ill. So should you be <laughs> calling them? I've worked in many fields, but this one is really super complex. There's always so much going on. And then there's also just those that don't buy in, mm -hmm. right? Then... Yeah, those that don't buy in is hard from sometimes implementing, but then also even just publishing your research. Yeah. Right? Which yeah. we get some very interesting comments, like, you know, just one liner that says, I remember this one should be dogs should not be in a, an emergency department. And I thought, and that's your entire review. I guess you're rejecting yeah. the paper. Okay. Next reviewer, <laughs> right? It's just, it's all so interesting. And everything everyone's doing of bringing together as much as we can qualitative and quantitative and those mixed methods is just so important to to add some flavor some understanding to the field yeah well thank you for persevering through some of those more <laughs> difficult comments yeah. i remember i remember when i was looking up the history of animal assisted therapy boris levinson had like a similar yeah. reaction when he first presented therapy dogs for working with clients and yeah, you know, it's just someone, someone has to be the one to say no, like you really need to look at this. So thank you for yeah. being <laughs> persevering. Yeah. 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 Where would you like to see the future of therapy dog research go? You know, I'm really interested in kind of like you were saying the bond that we have with our therapy dogs, but the impact of the team. So yeah. not just the impact of the dog, but the impact of the team, because yeah, there's just some really great special people who are out volunteering and so forth with their therapy dogs, right? And I think just people feel that if you're a patient or you're someone in a, a shelter or you're in the hospital, like wherever you are, you're a university student and the dogs are coming, right? Mm -hmm. I think that honesty and genuineness and all of that is just part of why the person's there. They're not there for any ulterior motive, right? They're just yeah. there to spend time with their dog and to help you and provide yeah. support and comfort to you. So I, I would really like to start to pull that apart and see what the impact is, maybe in some type of controlled trial. We have talked about this as a next stage, haven't really come to a decision or funding <laughs> of what that will be, but I think that's really important. So in the interim, we also will release on November the 3rd, which is one, one health day globally okay. on my website, therapy dog training for the handlers. Okay. So you know, it's completely free and we did it in four areas. Each module is about two hours. And we looked at the importance of inclusivity of who your participants are. So making sure you're yeah. a good handler that way. We looked at the mental health of the handler as one module. We looked at mental, mm -hmm, mental <laughs> health of the clients or the participants and also the safety and the health of the dog and Anne Howie uh, did a talk in that last one there. So we have those modules and yeah, that's free. It's going to be free and people can get a certificate out of that. 
So many people on our team and with St. John's Ambulance, Jane Smith had done some fundraising to support this with her dog, Murphy. He was the first therapy dog in the emergency department here. And yeah, and just how important that training is. So we're yeah. really excited that that's coming out and really want to make that so widely available to individuals. And so yeah. I think it fits along that again, you're a team, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think even the field has come further from the beginning, which I think you know, like a decade ago, kind of almost there when I was entering, it was really just about the dog. And I think yeah. we're having these discussions now where it's not just a dog, it's our relationship with the dog it is also the environment that you're in. So again, bringing those three together and trying to have a, a good understanding of what's happening there. Yeah, I love that. Well, I was going to ask you what advice you have for therapy doc teams based on your research, <laughs> but it sounds like it might be to check out yes. the testing on November 3rd. <laughs> yes, lots of our research is in there, that's for sure, yeah. <laughs> and they can find that at ColleenDell.com? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Under initiative, there's a little thing at the top says initiatives, and you'll see it in there. Okay, that's really yeah. great. Do you have any other advice for handlers or prospective handlers that you've seen come out of your own experience and research? I think that probably the most important thing is when people say, can you train, you know, I want to train my dog to be a therapy dog. You know, you can train for obedience and or whatever word you want to use, right, mm -hmm. to have those good interaction skills, but you can't train to be a therapy dog. The dog is who the dog is. And there's no, right, that's their personality. Either they want to be out and about or they don't. Yeah, and so like even with EJ, who clearly doesn't still listen all that great. <laughs> He's not even in the sun anymore. He's gone the other way. But it's respecting him. I'm not going to force you to come here if you don't right. want to come here, right? It's like, right. oh, yeah, she's blah, blah, blahing again, which means she's ignoring <laughs> me because that's what I do in this room, right? Right. So <laughs> it's just knowing who they are. And just respecting them for that. But yeah, the one question I think if we could like always address is like, how do I train my dog to be a therapy dog? And it's like, you can't. It is just who they are. And that's so important. It's just like, are you an introvert or an extrovert? And then also deciding where is a good place for them to be. So EJ grew up during COVID. He had not a lot of interaction. We did the best that we could. So he, at this point, you know, it'll probably take a couple of years. He's really good if he's been somewhere and then he's into there. And it's like more of like, he loves the prison. Oh, he yeah. just loves the prison. It's just great. It's high energy and it's good. But, you know, I probably, he wouldn't be a dog at this point, if in the future even, to go into emergency department. Too much going on yeah. would be, it would just be a lot for <laughs> him, right? Because that he just didn't grow up with so much going on for him. So right. just taking who he is, plus his environment and how he grew up. And maybe that'll change, especially as he gets out more and more now, right? But yeah, uh, yeah just respecting who they are. And it's okay if they don't want to go out and visit. It's okay. And I should just mention, too, that we also did quite a bit of research during COVID because we took the therapy dogs online really quickly at both the university with our general community and also with the prison. And we have a couple articles that came out of there. And those connections were still incredibly important, even though they weren't face to face. Those connections that prisoners, for example, made with the dogs that they didn't know with the handlers and the dogs was, yeah, still really impactful. So lots for us to think about, I think, in different ways to be involved. Or if your dog retired, you know, maybe mm -hmm. there's something online you could still do with your dog. Look at Instagram Live, all these things, right? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Colleen. I really For appreciate sure. you spending some time and, and sharing your work. Is Absolutely. there anything else that you wanted to share while you're here? No, I think I'm okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank awesome. you. And for all that you're doing, this is so great to get the word out. Yeah. Thank you so much. For sure. Okay. Take care. You too. Bye. Bye.